Aloha and welcome to Island Connections. I'm Brahim Audi. Palestine in biography. And this is the topic that uh, we have two guests to discuss uh, to discuss it. Uh, Cynthia Franklin, the professor of English at UH Manoa, co-editor of the journal Biography comes out from English. And uh, Craig, uh, but, uh, yeah, um, from the Center of Biographical Research. And uh, also Craig Howes, uh, he is a professor of English and also director of the Center for Biographical Research. And he is also co-editor of Biography. Uh, so welcome and thank you for coming over. Uh, I just want to ask uh, you, Craig, uh, first to, to say something about uh, your work um, in biography, the journal, as, as regards to the um, uh, special issue about uh, life in, Occup um, you know, in occupied Palestine. Okay, well, uh, biography is a forum journal that's been running since 1978, and mm -hmm. it comes out quarterly, so every 90 days we're putting out a volume. So we've been doing this for quite a long time, and one of the things we do is try and identify uh, special subjects mm -hmm. where we can bring a number of people who really know something about it together to talk about that in terms of how telling the stories of people's lives are important to that particular issue. Mm -hmm. uh, this one I didn't even have to think about because Cindy has been so involved in issues involving uh, Palestine. Um, she's also visited and actually specifically went to be able to do kind of preliminary research and make contacts for an issue in which we could talk about the importance of autobiography and biography and letters in the continuing situation in Palestine. So when she came back and said, we've definitely got the material for a special issue, all I had to do was say, we're a forum journal, that's what we do, so let's move forward and figure out what we can do. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And uh, Cindy, mm -hmm. uh, would you like to say more about uh, the biography journal issue? Well, I was really grateful to Craig and the rest of the biography staff because I did go, in fact, to the West Bank for the purpose of putting together mm -hmm. this special issue, and they were immediately supportive, which is not something to take for granted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my idea initially was to find editors um, working at Palestinian universities mm -hmm. and just hand the project mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, because I didn't have anybody particularly in mind or committed to that, I was also looking for people that might participate. And I was warned immediately it would be difficult to find uh, people to edit, given the amount of time that it takes to edit a project like this, and um, given the fact that academics there are teaching four classes, have you know 120 students minimum, and also can take extra hours just to get I mean, just getting to campus, as you well know, is mm -hmm. a challenge. And so the kind of day-to-day -day life um, obstacles were compounding the fact that people are, are tremendously overworked. Um, and so I was very happy when you agreed <laughs> to co-edit this, <laughs> along with Morgan Cooper, who mm -hmm. I met in um, Ramallah, mm -hmm. um, who was a former UH student who is very committed to these issues. Mm -hmm. But it was really great to be on the West Bank, to meet a number of the contributors in the special issue were ones I was able to meet with. And um, so I'm just really thrilled at the way mm -hmm. that it came together. And Morgan being um, running a cafe mm -hmm. <laughs> there, as you know, had all these contacts. So mm -hmm. we were able to pull in additional mm -hmm. contributors. Yeah. And uh, so uh, this, do you anticipate any kind of, uh, say, backlash uh, on that issue uh, from Zionists, let's put it that way, who might not want to see um, another or an alternative uh, narrative or alternative narratives to the main or dominant Zionist issue uh, narrative? Um. I absolutely expect yeah. pretty fierce backlash. Hopefully it won't be, you know, um, too overwhelming. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that whenever just acknowledging Palestinian existence, mm -hmm. uh, you meet with backlash. Mm -hmm. And I certainly, at any point that I've done anything remotely public in relation to Palestine, have received quite a bit of hate mail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, reports to campus administrators, putting them on notice that I'm doing this, 
various kinds, nothing that has you know, been a true impediment, but I do expect that there will be some negative responses, some what about the other side? How come you haven't given two sides? Uh, and you know, one of the things we talk about in the introduction is that we have many sides, that this is a complex and many-sided issue. And it's not a two sides that you're pro or anti-Palestinian, but that life in occupied Palestine is a, is very complex. Yeah. Um, so I do expect to be told I'm a self-hating Jew and mm. to um, be told that this is an imbalanced um, representation. Yeah. <clears throat> it's funny, like um, throughout the years, uh, I've uh, noticed that only when the Palestinian or a Palestinian side or pro-Palestinian side is being narrated, shall we say, uh, that the designers would say, oh, how about the other side? But um, they don't say the same thing and say, okay, let's have the Palestinian sides and we have, since we already have had Zionist points of view. They mm -hmm. never say that. Mm -hmm. So it tells you something where they're coming from and what their intentions are and so on. This has been my experience for the past like 40 years. Well, and that uh, ties yeah. into a larger issue too, yeah. at universities and then into our journal as well, mm -hmm. which is, one of the things we have a responsibility for is providing a kind of forum where different points of view and different positions can be articulated mm -hmm. and expressed. Mm -hmm. So for example, we've published quite a number of articles that deal specifically with the Holocaust, that deal with the Jewish diaspora, that deal with, in fact, versions of leadership in Israel and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Um, you can often be showing the other side by your collective activity over a period of mm -hmm. time. You don't always have to make sure that all sides are represented every time an opinion is right. expressed. Right. So, um, and one of the things we look for in our special issues, we want advocacy, we want people who are deeply committed to a project and wanting to articulate in a clear way particular related positions on something. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that once you've allowed for that, you therefore have shut down the possibility of anything else. And that's one of the biggest fights that's going on in terms of the notion of free speech on university campuses. Mm -hmm. People are wanting to be selective and say, this kind of opinion can never be stated without its being refuted the moment it's said. Mm -hmm. That's not free speech and it's not showing both sides. And I think what Stephen Salida has called the Palestinian exception to the mm -hmm. First Amendment mm -hmm. certainly holds mm -hmm. there yeah. because I do think it's especially um, you get a uh, particularly vociferous response when it is Palestine. And um, at Nora Erekat's talk on Sunday, a woman, and the first person to ask her a question said, aren't you ashamed of yourself bringing your daughter to this venue and hearing, you know, teaching her hate? Mm -hmm. And this woman came up to me after and she said, wasn't she full of hate? Mm -hmm. And I said, I didn't hear any hate. What did you hear? And she said, talking about all those murdered children. <laughs> and that reminded me of, you know, the kind of lawsuit in Israel mm -hmm. that said it was inciting, you know, unrest to publicize the names of the children that were killed mm -hmm. during the onslaught on Gaza mm -hmm. during Operation Protective Edge. And I think the U.S. counterpart to that is this idea that to talk about these things is to promote hate. Yeah. Right, and this is uh, very troubling in a country that, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, says that it's promoting democracy and freedom and liberty around the world. And when it comes to these things in the United States, this particular uh, matter, like the Palestinian issue and so on, it is blocked. Okay, so if you don't practice democracy and freedom and liberty in your own country, Who's going to believe you that you are going uh, to, you know, promote democracy and liberty and all of that elsewhere? I mean, that's... Uh, yeah, the uh, people who are going to believe you are the ones inside your own country. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, in fact, uh, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Nora Irakat uh, because <clears throat> one of the things um, I heard, uh, you know, about her coming over, even before her coming over to Hawaii um, one, a week ago, I think, mm -hmm. Less than that. Uh, yeah, yeah, less than that. Yeah. Uh, and she did like uh, three uh, talks, mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, on the Palestinian issue, etc. that uh, uh, there has been already a commotion or some kind of uh, opposition to her coming over from Zionists on campus and perhaps, uh, uh, you know, outside of campus. So um, any ideas uh, on that, uh, Craig or Cindy? Or um, 
I think the difference here is, as both of you have been mentioning, this particular issue immediately provokes a strong response over a really wide range of the community. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, you know, every time we have somebody speaking about Hawaiian independence and that kind of thing, there are people in the community who are upset about that and would just as well have the person not say it. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're really talking about here is an issue of degree and an issue of de importance addressed to it. That for whatever reason, if the issue is Palestine, there is a much stronger sense of this is something that should not be articulated. Um, and you know, my only response to it is that uh, the university and the larger community and the places where she spoke are places that are trying to not only educate but make people aware of actions that are frequently being done in their name. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's just a matter of degree rather um, more than difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any um, thoughts on that? I think that uh, a measure of how successful that visit was, was a kind of panicked response to it. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things I really appreciate about her analysis is she stays very close, she cleaves very closely to facts. Mm -hmm. uh, she does not need to put names on things mm -hmm. that are, that people can fight over what is the legal definition of genocide, say. Mm -hmm. She just talks about what happened, mm -hmm. how many people died, how many buildings were destroyed. It's very difficult to to resist that, and I think some of the, the kind of vehemence of response is because there are inroads being made when those facts on the ground are being reported mm -hmm. in a very, you know, kind of um, a way that you actually can't argue with the facts themselves. And so I think that, and, and in a different way, I think one of the things that um, is a contribution of this journal is in, in many cases, people are talking about their personal experiences. Mm -hmm. And you cannot say that that's a lie mm -hmm. or that's propaganda. It is what people experienced. Mm -hmm. And I think that itself to kind of have people talking about mm -hmm. their everyday lives that are also lives of pretty extraordinary violence mm -hmm. um, are things that can't really be argued yeah. in, insofar as they are people saying, this is what happened to me. Here are these photographs. Here is this kind of documentation. And so when, um, when I've written more um, factual pieces, you just have to fact check things into the ground. Because if you get an, an underreport numbers, because if you get anything wrong, then it invalidates your whole project. And with this special issue, there wasn't, you know, the fact checking, happened differently because often it was people saying, when I was four, this happened to my father. Mm -hmm. You can't argue with Fact somebody about that. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah so that's, uh, that's good. Before uh, we go into more uh, detail about uh, life in occupied Palestine, the uh, special issue of biography, um, and because we also mentioned uh, Nora's uh, visit here, Nora Arakat, uh, I interviewed uh, Nora and uh, I just asked her about, uh, you know, some kind of biographical sketch of herself. And so it's about three minutes, and mm -hmm. then we can, like, talk more about her visit, um, you know, and her uh, activism um, in relationship to uh, the biography mm -hmm. issue and uh, the other events that happened here, mm -hmm. the three events that happened here. So we will watch uh, Nora's uh, first uh, segment. I began... My, my career and my passion as an activist and an organizer, and in fact graduated law school to take an organizing job to plant boycott, divestment, and sanctions uh, campaigns throughout universities, churches, and communities uh, right after graduating law school. It was uh, a return to law, so to speak, because I realized that in organizing I wanted to buttress what we were doing on the ground with uh, broader analysis, more skills, different forms of intervention that all add up into some sort of uh, political action, so to speak. And so that marked my journey back into academia. Um, but in the meantime, I continued my human rights advocacy on the Hill in Congress and then um, in Lebanon 
with a human rights attorney on behalf of um, Iraqi refugees who are administratively detained by the state. And then for a couple of years on behalf of a Palestinian NGO um, with ECOSOC status to the United Nations. And so I represented Palestinian refugee NGO um, before the UN Human Rights Council, the different treaty making bodies and the diplomatic missions in New York. And in freshman in college was the most formative experience because at that point, and I had to lie to my family to get there, I received a scholarship um, and didn't tell them and used some of the scholarship money to actually buy a ticket to Palestine to volunteer in refugee camps, which was something that our family didn't do because even within Palestinian society, it's stratified socioeconomically. So Palestinians don't all love one another and they have internal racism and they have, you know, uh, class warfare. Mm -hmm. And so for me to volunteer in a refugee camp was, was not something that everyone was excited about. And that was the most formative experience for me. Once I returned from that trip, it became something very deeply ingrained that of all, because I wanted to work on human rights issues all over the world. Mm -hmm. I wanted to work in Pakistan. I wanted to work in Africa. I wanted to work in South America. I wanted to be a doctor and just be able to travel the world to pr do some good. And after that experience, I thought, this is what I have to do. Um, and I went back as a foreign exchange student from Berkeley to Hebrew University because they didn't allow me to study at a Palestinian university for my safety. So they sent me to a school where I would be an outed minority mm -hmm. um, in, in ways that was, I, I think, very problematic. And during that visit, the second Intifada started. Mm -hmm. And one of the first five young men who were killed at the Al-Aqsa Mosque was my neighbor in Abu Dis. Yeah, so this is like biographical and uh, connects well with the issue itself. Uh, so any comments? Um, this is a really distinctive issue because for the most part, um, which people always find out uh, and are somewhat surprised, we don't, biography that really doesn't publish biographies or autobiographies. What it does is it publishes critical, historical, sociological, interpretive pieces about biography and autobiography, how these are important in certain societies, whether it's testimonial, which we were sort of talking about a little bit earlier, uh, whether it's letters and so on and so forth. So this particular issue all right, actually has much more sort of first person narrative in it than most of our issues do. But it was really appropriate for this one because, as Cindy's been pointing out, uh, just the telling of the stories, of getting the stories out there, is a critical and theoretical act. It's an assertion that the very story is important because you have to know that this is what's going on. So, um, yeah, it's uh, the fact, I'm not surprised that in that clip, what we get is a kind of autobiography, but you'll notice all the way through, it was sort of critically engaged with, and this is why I had to take this position, and this is when I came to understand this. And that's what we do as a journal. Mm -hmm. So in this particular case, having these first person narrative fits with the mission of the larger journal. And I think most of the first person narratives actually do reflect mm -hmm. on that act of storytelling mm -hmm. or writing, with with very few exceptions, mm -hmm. most of them are quite consciously theorizing what it means to, to narrate their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, we have here uh, a life in occupied uh, Palestine biography. Uh, that's your your Facebook page. Uh, uh, it's the Facebook a page Facebook for page the, for the special, for the special issue. issue. Yeah. So could you uh, walk us through some of that? Uh, sure, let's see if I can just navigate this. Oops, that was not what I wanted to do. Um, so we put together a Facebook page um, to begin publicizing the special issue. And we have had quite a, um, I don't know why it keeps jumping back. Yeah, We've had quite an sensitive. enthusiastic response to it. And if I can scroll down here, I can show you that we have, I think, close to 700 likes and it's not mm -hmm. out yet. And I'm trying not to show you personal mail that is coming <laughs> in, um, 674 likes. But one of the things we're doing here is we are um, highlighting some of the, the, um, the um, things our contributors continue to do. So Sonia Namir, who is, has written a piece of memoir for us, just one 
an award for um, children's literature, mm -hmm. Arabic children's literature. Um, we've had a number of our, our two of our Gaza contributors um, wrote quite a bit during Operation Protective Edge when one of them um, had his brother and five family members killed and his house, mm -hmm. his family house destroyed. Mm -hmm. And so he was writing quite actively about that. So we've been using this page to let people meet these authors. We have included little snippets to give people a taste of what is coming mm -hmm. um, from each of the pieces. And that's been uh, quite effective. Mm -hmm. And so we're just trying to give space on this page to, to each of our authors. And um, it's been kind of great to see how this is spreading. Because this is my page, I can see how many people these things have reached. And uh, it does suggest that there's quite a bit of interest mm -hmm. in this special issue. Um, we have some bios of the authors as well as um, information about the special issue, which will be coming out, as you know, at the beginning of February. Yeah, I think February. we just got yeah. that date yeah. confirmed. Yeah. Also, uh, in terms of like distribution uh, mm -hmm. for that, I mean, uh, the Facebook page is good for publicity, etc. But in terms of distribution, uh, you, you people can buy buy the issue, right? Um, those people who are um, like subscribed to it will get that issue. Others will uh, buy an issue, but uh, also, is it going to be for free? All right, it's yeah. it's a, a complicated issue, and let me map that out. Um, the first thing is that it's an academic journal, mm. and in fact, the major point of access for most of our issues is by institutions that subscribe to Project Muse mm. or ProQuest mm. or one of the places mm. that distributes us, which means that right off the bat, we already know that this is going to be available to over 2,000 institutions mm. who have these subscriptions. Mm. So then you multiply that by the number of thousands of people that are the, out of those institutions. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's going to be available academically to mm -hmm. virtually everybody who has access to one mm -hmm. of these, which is very substantial. Mm -hmm. right? You can also buy individual copies of it, uh, but for the most part, it's distributed electronically. Mm -hmm. This particular issue, though, and we've been in discussions with uh, UH Press about this in terms of uh, distribution, raises some other issues. Mm -hmm. um, one of those issues is the physical copy Copies, there might be difficulties getting them into Palestine. Right. So we're having to deal with issues of security and how to make those things go through. Mm -hmm. The second is that we're dealing with a fairly substantial population that might be interested in this issue who would not identify themselves as academics, but interested in it because it is providing this kind of range and this kind of size of presentation of critical narratives about today in Palestine. So the other thing we'll be looking at, our policy generally is for individual authors that they always have the right to redistribute that in their individual articles mm -hmm. in whatever way they want. Mm -hmm. So any author will be able to put it up on their homepage or mm -hmm. put it wherever they want to. The big issue, though, is because we believe, especially because you and Cindy and Morgan have put the work you have in, it works as a collection as well, too. Mm -hmm. So the other thing we're going to be negotiating on is to figure out if there are ways through certain venues to make this available, as you say, for free to certain communities. Wow. For example, can we set it up so that pers people using a search engine in Palestine will be able to have access to it for free without having to go through the pi firewall of Project Muse? Mm -hmm. uh, those are things that we're actively involved mm -hmm. in negotiating and really aware of. So it's going to be highly available in a variety of ways. And for this particular issue, we're going to try and make it even more available. Yeah, wonderful. Um, and, uh, you know, just my hope, I just thought of that. Hopefully someone will translate it to, like, uh, other languages, like Arabic or... Uh, my guess is your uh, contacts are better than that <laughs> and mine. No, 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 I know. <laughs> <laughs> I've been thinking about that just now, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it will be good. Um, and uh, we, um, like Cindy, Morgan, and I, and I'm sure, like, uh, Cindy also, uh, consulted you in terms of uh, more publicity uh, about that beyond the Facebook page and other things. Uh, any ideas like uh, you want to talk about these uh, matters? Well, we did use Nora's visit to launch, yeah, right. you know, to pre launch the special issue. Yeah. And I'm going to be doing study abroad in London and hope to um, 
be promoting the issue since Palestine. There's so much Palestine um, activism mm -hmm. in London, mm -hmm. and I have a few different places where I'm going to give talks and be able to promote mm -hmm. the special issue because it will be out by then. Mm -hmm. And then I also, at the end of that time, am planning to visit Morgan in Ramallah. Mm -hmm. And I've been talking with contributors about doing launches in um, at Birzeit, mm -hmm. or if not at Birzeit, then in Ramallah, mm -hmm. and then Abu Dis. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, because so many of our contributors are either in, you know, in, in you know, kind of in the West Bank, mm -hmm. the hope is to be able to to do some launches there and then on the way back in the Bay Area. So uh, mm -hmm. I've been in conversation with some people on the US Academic and Cultural Boycott Organizing Collective about holding some events in San Francisco, Stanford, and um, the, generally the Bay Area mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the spring. Yeah, and then we can count uh, this program as one of the yes. promotions. And one other one as well yeah. um, at the Modern Language Association. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The Division of uh, Biography, Autobiography, and Life mm -hmm. Writing is sponsoring a panel that uh, Cindy mm -hmm. put together mm -hmm. for people involved in the issue, and especially because the whole Palestinian issue is going to be so visible at the MLA this year, mm -hmm. uh, I suspect an awful lot of people are going to find out about yeah, the special yeah. issue just simply because they're going to want to attend the session. Yeah. There has been a, there was a, there were two proposals for resolutions for this year's MLA that are, you know, there's about 20,000 members of the Modern Language Association, so it's a very large conference. Um, of course, not all 20,000 come to yeah, each conference, right. but it is a big conference. And uh, some people put forward an academic boycott resolution in keeping with the one that the American Studies Association mm -hmm. endorsed along with um, the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association, mm -hmm. the Asian American, the Association for Asian American Studies Association. Um, somebody else put forward, another group put forward a kind of anti-boycott resolution. Mm -hmm. And so the MLA executive committee has said, let's take both these resolutions off the table and we will have discussion about Palestine for the next few years, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, a far better outcome than mm -hmm. the yeah. kind of fighting and Robert's rules mm -hmm. negotiating that takes mm -hmm. place at the delegate assembly. Yeah. So I think there will be a space to discuss Palestine um, at the, this year's MLA, and it will be a very good place for the special issue to be promoted. Yeah, uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, in the biography issue, this uh, on life in occupied Palestine, um, there is um, one uh, uh, piece in particular that talks about uh, BDS, uh, boycott, divestment, uh, sanctions, right? Well, at I the think end, at, at the, the end, end there's yeah. one focused right. on that. But one of the things that, for me at least, was very striking and that um, in some ways was unsurprising after visiting five Palestinian universities, and no matter how... Um, a conversation started, it was like all roads led to BDS mm, yeah. because we were asked repeatedly to support academic boycott mm -hmm. by Palestinian academics from mm -hmm. various, you know, yeah. <laughs> a, kind of a spectrum of political engagement and mm -hmm. perspectives. They all said, please support academic boycott. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that was striking was that a lot of contributors, I think, made um, a point of you know, suggesting the importance of that as a nonviolent Palestinian-led call mm -hmm. for, as part of a global um, grassroots effort. But, and that was why it was great to be able to end that um, special issue with Omar Barghouti and Palestine. Mm -hmm. We caught in an interview and getting them to talk about BDS. And I think this summer was so interesting in relation to biography issues just because of the ways that like celebrities like, you know, Scarlett Johansson yeah. was using <laughs> yeah. her celebrity status and SodaStream was using her celebrity mm -hmm. status to kind of make appealing a uh, product that was being mm -hmm. made in an illegal settlement. Mm -hmm. And then I think there were a lot of BDS activists that did, you know, a lot through memes and social media to expose the human rights um, violations that capitalized on ScarJo's, mm -hmm. you know, visibility. And so I think that the kind of um, role that individual celebrities have played either in attempting to provide a pretty cover for Palestinian violations, for violations of Palestinians' human rights, or in the case of, say, um, Pink Floyd's Roger Waters to mm. promote 
um, BDS and justice in Palestine. I think the role of the individual in the BDS movement has been quite interesting that way. Yeah. Uh, so I want to go to uh, another segment of Noura Rekat's uh, interview, and this is about BDS, so we can know more. She uh, has a good uh, discussion of it, and then we can talk about that. So we go to Noura's. So the first is to say, what is BDS? It stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions. And it is, it, it, it is associated with the Palestinian movement for freedom, dignity, and justice. It was issued by a large, large swath of Palestinian civil society organizations and political parties on July 9, 2005. That was exactly one year after the International Court of Justice had issued its advisory opinion deeming the route of the annexation wall illegal for actually uh, disrupting the territorial integrity of the West Bank and arbitrarily uh, circumscribing the illegal settlements built there, especially around East Jerusalem. 85% of the length of the wall is actually built in the West Bank. That ICJ decision had told, had said to the states or high contracting parties to the Geneva Convention, so meaning all 193 states, that you have an obligation not to engage in any type of business with Israel that would either expand the length of the wall or perpetuate the occupation. In essence, the international court had said to the international community, you must sanction Israel because the occupation is illegal. And instead, the US condemned the report, Israel ignored the report, and the Palestinian Authority, at the pressure of the United States, shelved the report in lieu of a promise for better negotiating positions and more international donor aid. And so a year after that monumental decision and a call to the international community to sanction Israel, when nothing had happened of the sort, that this is when the 170 civil society organizations say, international community, be in solidarity with us by boycotting, divesting, and sanctioning Israel until and when it complies with three international law and human rights norms, namely the return of refugees, Palestinian refugees, the end of Israeli colonization of Arab lands, and the e equality for all Arab citizens or Palestinian citizens of the Israeli state. And at, at the time that it was issued in 2005, for most people who are still committed to the Oslo Accords, the peace process, um, found it laughable and a bit fringe. But now, as we've seen, the failure of the two-state solution, it, Israel has torpedoed that solution. The failure of the US, even when it is willing, it's been unable to pressure Israel to cease any of its dilatorious practices. And the, the, the absolute, there's, there's no movement forward because now Israel has declared that it'll never end its occupation of the West Bank and that Gaza has already ended its occupation, which is completely false. So we've hit a dead end where it's clear to those who are paying attention that if the two-state solution is not viable, the peace process has brought us here. So it's, a, it's actually the success of the peace process that's brought us to this dead end. Then what? And if the Palestinian Authority can't resist Israeli occupation and settler colonialism because they are subject to U.S. tutelage, who do we turn to? And this is when BDS becomes, as a, as a confluence of fortune and tragedy, gains traction because it's seen not only as a viable option for the involvement of global solidarity in a nonviolent global peace movement, but it's seen as uh, very effective because you are circumventing diplomatic intransigence in order to affect uh, the status quo, in order to apply pressure onto Israel. Now, there's criticism that this will never end the occupation of Israel. There's not going to be any kind of economic impact that will alter its uh, behavior. And that's absolutely true. Boycott, divestment, and sanctions, BDS, is not a liberation movement. It's a solidarity tactic. A liberation movement has to be defined and led by Palestinians that's comprehensive, that includes other tactics, including legal mechanisms, media mechanisms, other forms of resistance, diplomatic engagement. But BDS is absolutely crucial to that mosaic. 
And it's it certainly has had an impact because it's shifted the discourse from one about Israel's national security to being one about Israel as a pariah apartheid state. And for Israel, who has is very invested not only in establishing hegemonic control over um, Israel and the occupied territory, so to speak, but is very invested in its image as a civilizational force, the beacon of democracy in the Middle East, um, as a David against an Arab Goliath. Uh, this is very troubling to it. It doesn't want to be associated with South Africa or Saudi Arabia or Iran. It actually thinks it's much better when, in fact, uh, the facts on the ground demonstrate a completely different reality. Yeah, so, uh, Craig, uh, any reflections on that? or? Well, just back to what Cindy was saying before, you can see that uh, Nora works from a very solid basis of history and uh, legal engagement and uh, also a kind of balanced presentation, and I mean balanced in the sense of looking at the materials and saying, okay, it could go this way, it could go that way, that we're talking about a spectrum, that there's not just a single thing here. And that was what was impressive about her entire presentation, mm -hmm. and also I think what's impressive about the range of responses within the special issue as well, too. Mm -hmm. Because within the special issue, you have uh, people covering 30 or 40 years of this experience. Mm -hmm. uh, you have people, there's editions of letters from earlier times, diaries of earlier times, and if you can see it historically, because there's as much history there as there is any place on Earth, mm -hmm. if you can see it that way, you can actually get out of this business of just assuming it's either got to be this or that, mm -hmm. decontextualized from everything. And mm -hmm. I think everybody appreciated uh, Nora's ability to give people context and explain and put things together that they were aware of as fragmentary mm -hmm. and to tie into life writing, put them in a narrative. Mm -hmm. She's just really impressive. Yeah, yeah. So, um, um, if you could talk about these matters also uh, in terms of your own activism uh, to U.S. academic boycott in Israel, uh, and um, because you are the one who, like, really was the main engine behind her coming over to Hawaii. Um, her coming over to Hawaii had a lot to do with meeting her, in mm -hmm. fact, um, in relation to boycott. Mm -hmm. um, we were both at the American Studies Association conference, and there was an organizing collective, a U.S. Act the organizing collective dinner that she was in attendance at um, as a PACB, you know, and U.S. ACB um, involved person. And uh, we sat next to each other at dinner, and she was really interested in Hawaii as a site of settler colonialism mm -hmm. and occupation. And so, you know, we talked about the need to get her out here. Mm -hmm. But I think that for me, the um, work in biography is a work of advocacy that, you know, Craig had said these special issues can be, you know, and often are works of ad advocacy. And it's, uh, for me, a forum not so much to promote specifically, you know, BDS, but I think that um, just the very act of documenting and allowing people to tell their stories um, makes a very compelling case for the claims that attend BDS, which Nora outlined, and they are, you know, basically to follow international law. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is really what it gets down to. Mm -hmm. uh, equality, dismantling an illegal wall, you know, withdrawing, um, you know, ending an occupation, mm -hmm. and giving a right of return, which is also uh, decreed under international law uh, for Palestinians. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, for me, these, um, you know, this kind of academic work and then the work for U.S. ACB are in some ways one and the same. And I think that one of the things that I have learned in relation to Palestine is it can never be purely academic mm -hmm. because to even say the word Palestine, you are going to come under attack mm -hmm. if you say it in any, I mean, actually even just to acknowledge Palestinian existence, you will come under attack. Um, and then on the other side of it, if you are doing political work, you have to know your history. Mm -hmm. You have to know your facts because you slip and, you know, people can and will go after you for the slightest slips as a way of discrediting the whole movement, which is something that is true to many different kinds of political movements that people find threatening in terms of destabilizing 
privileged positions. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that scholarship and activism tend to go together mm -hmm. in relation to Palestine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, like, maybe to talk about, uh, you can select which one you want to talk about in more detail. I, I saw, like, uh, I mean, we heard earlier about Gaza, mm -hmm. you know, and how <clears throat> the writer was writing under, you know, like, uh, grim conditions, uh, not only the attack, but I mean, he lost uh, family members, etc. So uh, you could say more about this or some other one and, you know, how, um, how um, really heart-wrenching those kinds of uh, uh, narrations are in terms of, uh, or how you felt about them as you read them. <laughs> You know, I love all the pieces yeah. in this special issue, and they're all really different from one another, and so it's really hard to pick ones, um, because I really do love them all. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I understand. You know, I have this yeah. attachment to right. them. Yeah. Um, you know, I had talked about Sonia and Amir a minute ago, right. who won the, right. the award for Arabic children's literature. I love her piece, which talks about being in prison for four years. Mm where um, there is just this mix of humor, mm -hmm. <laughs> the kinds of things that she and the women political prisoners did to subvert the guards' disciplinary mm -hmm. regimes. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, there's just this assertion of imagination as a form of resistance and survival in prison. Mm -hmm. So she talks about singing stars, and there's a building she can almost kind of sort of see where she imagines the life going on in that building based on when lights go on and off. And um, so I really love the combination of just beauty and imagination and humor in that piece. Um, I really love the very short, um, another prison piece by Saed Omar, who was a hunger striker, who it's just a very spare piece, mm -hmm. but he explains how food is not his issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, it ends with um, when he's leaving prison telling the guard, during his, the Israeli guard during his interview, um, I'm gonna go to the sea. Mm -hmm. And the guard's like, you can't go to the sea. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, I can go to the sea. I will go to the sea. I will take a picture, I will send, send it, it to you. you yeah. And the guard is just like, you'll be back in jail. <laughs> back in prison if you do that. You're not allowed to do that. Yeah. Uh, I love the assertion of that. Mm -hmm. um, I love the piece that is written by Nadara Shalhob um, Kervokian and um, Sarah Ihmud, mm. that is a kind of um, piece that is about friendship between mm -hmm. women academics of different generations mm -hmm. that are also tied to their families and their family stories and that um, they're theorizing the importance of telling and gathering stories mm -hmm. at the same time as they're forging a relationship mm -hmm. with each other. And so I really love that piece. Mm -hmm. Craig, as I'm curious what struck yeah, you as I was gonna ask, uh, um, Craig someone too. who yeah. well, worked I have, with these essays once yeah, they were right. yeah. handed over for copy editing. Yeah, I, I have the, the distinction of having read this entire special issue out loud uh, <laughs> because that's one of the ways we check it for typos yeah. and that kind of thing. And the one that I would actually uh, point to is the Yusuf uh, M. Uh, Al-Jamal mm. essay on traveling as a Palestinian. Yeah. Not so much because it's particularly programmatic or placing together a computer. He just describes, because he has a series of travels, what it is like to try and move around the world on a Palestinian passport. Mm -hmm. The number of times that he's re retained, the number of times that he's turned away at airports, the number of times that he's not allowed to get on planes, uh, the complete kind of reorganizing of his entire life each time. There's always people waiting at the other end for him to show up. He might show up tomorrow. He might show up two weeks later. And the fact that it's it's almost like the Walt Disney small world, no matter where he goes, he can hit this kind of trouble. Mm -hmm. So he can get stuck in Indonesia for a couple of weeks, or he could get stuck in Egypt for a few weeks, mm -hmm. or he gets stuck in Berkeley. And those aren't even places he necessarily went to. But <laughs> Just in, especially because when people, what happens is, right, when people mention Palestine frequently, even the most well-meaning or sympathetic people immediately start getting a very sad face mm -hmm. because they just, oh, God, I don't even want to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, but an essay like that, just saying, okay, yeah, there are real problems here, but 
it isn't just a matter of kind of sorrow and weight. Mm. It's also a matter of just sheer annoyance and, and uh, just dickering with your life. And that that's something that also is there. That those minor indignities give you an even fuller picture of, I mean, for, I'm sure, for example, these kind of things happen to Nora at various yeah. points, yeah. that she just simply has to deal with life is more difficult in annoying ways because you're identified with this issue or because you're Palestinian. And I think the issue really gives a kind of sense of just those everyday indignities that are involved, as well as those larger global life and death situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'm looking at uh, this biography uh, journal issue, and I'm seeing like, uh, trying to imagine the extent of uh, its impact, perhaps, uh, on uh, um, you know, activism, uh, let's say, um, in the US, I mean, and beyond, of course, but mm. let's say in the US about that. Because you mentioned uh, a number of things, like you know, they'd be available on Muse, uh, Project Muse, and mm. you know, other, other things, and they'd be available to everyone. So it has a, an impact on educating people you know, about, um, you know, Palestine and life under occupation in Palestine, uh, but also maybe uh, in terms of uh, the activism um, on, Pal uh, you know, um, for Palestine, uh, it might have that particular impact. Um, did you reflect on these things uh, at I, all? I can say a quick thing about yeah. that. And this ties into the sort of larger mission of biography mm -hmm. in the Center for Biographical Research. We sort of think of four stages to a lot of things. Mm -hmm. you know, the first one is that people know that something's coming out, which Cindy's been doing a great job <laughs> on. <you know. laughs> to get people to read it, mm -hmm. to make sure that it has an audience. Mm -hmm. To get people to talk about it, that's your educational function mm -hmm. that you're talking about. How does it get spread out there and people start talking about the issues? And then the fourth thing is, how does that then translate into some kind of activism? We use that for a collection called The Value of Hawaii that we've mm -hmm. done a couple of times now. And the ultimate goal is ultimately, you know, the, the ultimate goal is not how many readers did we get or how many subscribers did we get. It's to what degree it's been useful to make that kind of difference. So for example, right now, people are really aware it's coming out and we're putting that out more and more. It's going to be available in early February in a variety of venues. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping, because we do have a web page and Facebook and that kind of thing, that as people start reading it and using it, they'll we'll start getting people suggesting, here's how I'm teaching this in a particular class. Here's a place where we actually discussed a couple of these essays. Here's the, how that fed into here. And then be able to watch from there how then that moves into the kind of activism mm -hmm. that you're talking about. It's sort of like the um, uh, BDS uh, material. Mm -hmm. it's, not, you know, it's not the main strategy, but it's a supportive yes, one yeah. that can actually provide an environment where mm -hmm. people can get directed toward ways of engaging with this issue more fully. Yeah, in fact, uh, a couple of things, like uh, I'm teaching uh, a course called Hawaii and the Pacific, mm -hmm. and I'm using volume uh, one of Valley of Hawaii, <laughs> which goes very well with the class, yeah. Uh, so that's the part on, mm -hmm. uh, on Hawaii. Um, I also teach a um, course on, on the Middle East, like politics and all of that. So um, I am thinking of uh, using uh, biography, maybe not this coming semester because it might not uh, be available like from the beginning, you see. Uh, but uh, uh, the following you even, it will be. <laughs> if you if you need PDFs to put up on Laulima so you can have access for your okay. class, you can have those immediately. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> it's on TV now. Too. I feel like a used car salesman. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You can get that. No, no, that's good. That's good because um, I I don't want them to buy this issue. I want them to. Uh, I want my students to have access to it. You know and. Well, they can get it later on through Project Muse, through yeah, the university. But if you need it in but, January, yeah, we okay. can figure okay. out a way of getting Thanks. access. I'll, I'll be in touch with you. <laughs> okay. So I wanted to add one other yeah. thing about right. this issue of, yeah. you know, what, you know, the hope for the special issue. And I know this is one you shared and that Morgan shared. And I was thinking about it because Dave Eggers, who does this kind of human rights and witnessing mm. series, has something out on you know, occupied Palestine. Mm -hmm. And I've always, you know, I like the title. And at the same time, I think that, you know, we've all been wanting not to have the 
emphasis go only to occupation and to the West mm -hmm. Bank and Gaza. And so one of the things that I really like about this special issue is it makes clear that there are problems in Israel proper mm -hmm. um, and that there is a lot of discrimination against Palestinians. And um, we are now seeing that, you know, getting uh, ever more codified into law, right? Mm -hmm. With the, mm -hmm. the passing of the nationality law mm -hmm. just this week mm -hmm. that, you know, kind of takes the de facto second class citizenship of Palestinians and makes it de jure. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that was, um, that's something that I'm happy the special issue documents is that this problem does, is not gonna go away if somehow the problems of the West, if, if the West, there was withdrawal from the West Bank, which of course there cannot be anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, in fact, um, on that, the, pass, the passage in the Knesset, so the Israeli mm -hmm. parliament, mm -hmm. about that like racist law. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, a couple of my students have reported on it because mm -hmm. I have like current events mm -hmm. and they report on it and we discuss those mm -hmm. after they report on it. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, uh, things are getting worse and worse and uh, more horrendous for the Palestinians who are uh, Israeli citizens mm -hmm. even, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, like what Nora was saying is that uh, there is like um, two tiers, uh, uh, citizenship and national, uh, nationality. So you, have, you can be a Jewish national and a Jewish uh, citizen, but you are only a Palestinian citizen or they mm -hmm. call it Arab citizen mm -hmm. but you cannot be an Arab, uh, Arab national or national uh, Arab national of the state of Israel mm -hmm. so already you see like the discrimination etc so um, that leads me uh, to something that uh, I asked Nora about uh, and uh, which is like you know um, what's the solution <laughs> to this whole <laughs> thing I mean after all you know people don't want to keep living uh, under occupation. And in fact, this is resistance, right, uh, in many ways. So um, she, she talks about, uh, Nora talks about two possible solutions that she can see. So we'll watch that and then we'll comment on it. So I actually think that there's two possible solutions. I think either the solution will be that we eventually approximate a one-state solution that's not built on distinction, difference with distinction. So basically a difference between Jews and Muslims and Christians where Jews have superior status, benefit from supremacy and privilege. That's one uh, where we actually dismantle that and actually develop a state of all its citizens, where we rehabilitate what the nation looks like, I think in, in brave ways, or the other solution is going to be a reality that looks much like either Native American reservations or South African Bantustans, where Palestinians will be concentrated onto small swaths of land where they enjoy semi-autonomy, but they're separated from one another. They are denied some sort of a holistic national identity, and they're, giving, they're given piecemeal privileges, but where Israel has prevailed. And Israel has tried both um, by entering into the, what it calls a two-state solution. Its vision of the two-state solution looks exactly like Bantustan's, which significantly was rejected by the UN General Assembly when white Afrikaners proposed the same solution for South African blacks. And yet here we're embracing that. And so we should find that really troubling if we are basing our analysis on certain principles that don't uh, sway with the wind or with time. The other thing to remember is that Israel's tactics is built on the twin axioms of the confiscation of the greatest amount of land with the least number of Palestinians on it, and then the concentration of the greatest number of Palestinians onto the smallest swaths of land. And Israel is making that a reality in the West Bank in East Jerusalem, which is part of the West Bank, although that's often forgotten, within Israel itself and in the Gaza Strip. And so we are seeing Israel create this new reality, a complete rejection of the two-state solution. So to imagine that we are now going to coax Israel into uh, reneging on, on what it has done in this reality that it's creating by appealing to some sort of its sensibility is to betray its, its, its constitution as a settler colonial society. It seeks to remove Palestinians. So we're actually fighting the same struggle, whether it is establishing the two-state solution or it is establishing a one-state solution, we still have to address Israeli settler colonial 
uh, motivation, which is to supplant and remove the indigenous population um, and to replace it and usurp their culture and to, to erase their memory and their presence. So either way, we're fighting a single struggle where we need to challenge the notion that Jews have a particular privilege and supremacy regardless of whether it's within the Israel's non-declared borders, because it's never declared its borders, or whether it's over the entire area of land, the struggle is the same. The difference is what outcome we want. So if we are fighting the same struggle, and we have a choice between an optimal and a suboptimal outcome, then, and in fact, the one-state solution isn't that optimal because it's rife with its own problems, but it's certainly optimal to the um, two-state solution, because at least there, there's the possibility of rehabilitating the Palestinian nation. At least there, there's the possibility of uh, the return of refugees and the, uh, the creation of, of, of a single, singular Palestinian identity, one that's not divided between the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, Israel, the refugees, diaspora, and so on and so forth. Yeah, that reminds me like, uh, you know, I once wrote a piece called The State Without Borders, Borders Without a State, <laughs> talking about the state of Israel, no borders, and then like uh, the National Palestinian Authority, it's not a state, but it is like border to hell, you know, <laughs> all over the place from like, uh, you know, barriers, all kinds of stuff, checkpoints, mm -hmm. flying checkpoints, etc. So yeah, she's, she reminded me of that. Uh, but uh, so, uh, what is your comment? I mean, we start, uh, we start with you, Sunday, on, on that. Well, as uh, <laughs> was the case during Nora's entire visit, I found myself in agreement <laughs> with her analysis. I think that she's right that what we have is one state right now. Uh -huh. And it's just an, a state without, with radical inequality and human rights violations for some of its, uh, some of the people living in that state. And so I'm quite persuaded that the solution is to say we have one state. Now let's try and make that a state of equality for everyone living there. And I think one of the things that um, I hope this special issue will do is dispel some of the kind of rhetoric of. Um, Making that argument is a form of wishing death on Jews mm. or disappearance <laughs> on Jews. Uh, yeah. Because over and again, we have contributors saying, we just want to live side by side. Yeah. <laughs> this was done in the past. It can be done again in the future. Mm -hmm. And so I think that you know one of the contributions that I hope this special issue will make is to dispel some of that very uh, rapid and easy slide people seem to make into thinking that a return for refugees or Palestinian equal rights e is equal to genocidal wishes towards Jews, <laughs> which regularly, that, that yeah. conflation is regularly made right. in a kind of demonization of Palestinians and casting Palestinians as full of hate. Yeah. Craig, uh, any? Well, the thing I was just going to add uh, was that one of the dimensions we did bring to her visit, especially in the third session that she did, was, okay, what are the applications, not only for our understanding of what's going on in Palestine, but more generally, what's going on in relation to notions of settler colonialism, and then more specifically, how it has to do with us right here, mm -hmm. because nation within a nation arguments mm -hmm. or uh, those kinds of arguments are also ones that are very compelling, and she was very good in terms of indicating there are certain kinds of similarities mm -hmm. structurally, but that each place has its own differences. Yeah. And I think the bottom line here is whatever way you're working with this, you do have to acknowledge that you can't just make a people disappear. Yeah. Right. And that accommodating some kind of future, some kind of destiny, some kind of capacity of self-governance has to be there no matter where it is in the world. Mm -hmm. And that what we're just looking at is we're aware of our own compelling case, but this is one of the most compelling and instructive cases that's currently going on in the world, regardless of what your engagement yeah. is with it. Yeah, I mean, the Palestinian um, position has um, always been uh, uh, you know, one state for all the people, and even if two states, then the return of the refugees. Uh, nobody's saying about like kicking the Jews out to the sea, etc. We live together, you know, but uh, they don't want that. Uh, they want uh, to get rid, even if it is one state, they want to get rid of all the Palestinians. Maybe, you know, they uh, would like to send them to Jordan, you know, and then let's keep this Jewish because. Uh, 
that's, that was our uh, land from uh, time immemorial or something like that. Okay, we're uh, flat out of time. Thank you very much uh, for mm -hmm. coming over, sharing your thoughts and uh, ideas with us. And uh, hopefully biography will uh, be uh, spread all over the world <laughs> and maybe also uh, you know, tr translated into at least Arabic. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you.